So ladies and gentlemen, at the start of video number two, I would like to let you in on a secret. And that secret is that paleontologists are often the butt of jokes amongst other scientists. As a result, we love to think of ourselves as useful and we absolutely love examples of where our field can um, be overtly useful. We're not just building knowledge, but we're building knowledge that can be applied to real world situations. Um, so we love to think, paleontologists as a whole, that we can provide useful insights in a range of different areas. And I, I, I think it's unfair that we're the butt of these jokes because I think we can, but then I'm biased, right? So take that for what it's worth. But in that context, conservation paleobiology is really, really uh, valuable to many um, paleontologists because this is an example where undeniably we think that the contributions that we can make are useful to something that really matters in the real world. A fantastic example of this is those extrinsic and intrinsic risk factors that I introduced in the lecture on extinction, where we know what's different factors, for example, uh, life cycle traits, etc., um, put species at risk of extinction. These are, in a large part, built from the study of the fossil record, where we can see in a large numbers over large periods of times what goes extinct and use that to build these pictures of what uh, we should consider when it comes to extinction risk. So in this video I'm going to be showing you a series of examples where without fossils we would draw erroneous conclusions about biotic change, vulnerability and resilience in today's ecosystems. So bear that in mind for what it is. This is the pitch, it's the case for the importance of the deep time approach that conservation paleobiology is based around. And obviously paleontologists, me included, have skin in this game. We care um, and we like to think that we are useful. I find it um, quite a compelling pitch and I encourage you to, to view it um, within that light of of kind of like these are case studies which I have chosen to show the usefulness of fossils and that doesn't mean that the other approaches that are not based in the deep um, deep time perspective that paleobiology can provide are not valuable it just means that together these two things these two approaches are stronger than they are apart so with that context I'm going to be spending the rest of this video providing some examples of where looking at living ecosystems alone can be kind of misleading. And we're going to be starting with what is an invasive species like, really? So normally within kind of popular culture in the news, um, whether something is invasive or not is couched in a great deal of certainty. We learn about invasive things as clearly being invasive, but actually distinguishing native from non-native taxa is a key challenge in conservation and it can be quite challenging. Indeed, the flora and the fauna that characterize an area prior to human colonization are generally poorly known. For obvious reasons, the fossil record is a key insight when it comes to documenting pre-colonization biota. By definition, pre-colonization, there weren't humans around to record what was present and what was not in any particular area. And indeed, turning to this as a resource has shown in a number of different areas that some species we have traditionally assumed to be invasive are in fact native. My example of this is based on this paper from 2001 by Bernie et al, um, which managed to show that the screw pine, the tree shown in the middle here, and the beech cordia or sea trumpet, uh, the flower of which is shown on the right here, um, were, these are species that were thought to have been introduced to the Hawaiian Islands by colonizing Polynesians. So they were thought to be invasive species. However, in this paper, um, the authors used pollen and seed evidence recovered from both coring and from excavations in a large sinkhole and cave system, which I've put on the uh, left-hand side here. Um, they used these records to show that both of these species were actually present in the islands for thousands of years before humans arrived. And now those species are being used in coastal and dry forest restoration efforts in the Hawaiian Islands. So the fossil record has provided a unique insight into what's native versus what's not in Hawaii. So the next example I wanted to use of how these geohistorical records can be valuable to us are based on measuring historical variability in an area. So if we want to put modern changes into the context of kind of like a deeper time perspective, we need to have an idea 
of the past mean of environmental factors, be that temperature, salinity, or any other range of a whole host of factors that we may care about. This range is called the historical range of variability or HRV. And we will often want to use this as a management target when it comes to conservation. And long-term records from, for example, sediment cords um, can be really, really valuable in helping establish this HRV. This is especially true if those cores have good resi resolution, so allow us to see annual to decadal trends. These trends can be used to constrain both the variability historically within a region, so how much of a range there is in these important factors, but they also allow us to discriminate variability around a stationary mean, so a range that's kind of going around a mean that isn't changing, versus variability associated with a long-term trend. So this may be variability around a mean that's actually going up or is going down over time. My example to illustrate this is a study by Walt, Wolf et al. from 2001, who looked at sediment cores from two alpine lakes in Colorado. One of these is shown on the left, and this is Sky Pond. It looks really beautiful, actually. Nice place to go on holiday, I imagine. And this used a study of the sediments and the diatoms, as shown here, in those sediments to look at this historical range of variability. This study showed that an increase in diatom abundance was coupled with um, 15 nit N, so nitrogen um, isotope 15, depleted sediments. This is shown in the graph on the right here. And in particular, I note that the um, x-axis here um, that shows you the range of change, or so rate of change between diatom assemblages, goes up to 0.1 on the x-axis for this graph, and goes up to two, so uh, orders of magnitude bigger on this axis here. So you've got this huge spike in recent years in the rate of change between diatom assemblages that's coupled with a depletion in the amount of um, 15N you get in your sediments. And these authors showed that though both those changes were responses to excess nitrogen derived from agricultural and industrial sources since the 1950s. They also demonstrated that the rate and the magnitude of shifts that they identified far exceeded the historical range of variability over the 14,000 year post-glacial history that these lakes have existed over. So I think that's a really, really good example of this idea of the HRV. So the next example focuses on how fossils and the um, fossil record can help us set a context for modern day biodiversity. And this is needed because it can be challenging to assess the impact of stress on biodiversity in modern ecosystems whilst those are being subjected to that stress. Kind of makes sense, right? Um, for example, if you want to measure species richness and diversity, but we only do so by collecting um, organisms from living ecosystems, those species that we collect can mislead. We may expect modern ecosystems to have both invasive species and to have suffered from recent extinctions that may go unrecognized of native taxa. And as such, we can't build a clear picture from a stressed ecosystem in and of itself what its um, biodiversity should be. A fine example of this is this paper by um, Bernie et al. that was published in 2008. Now, this was based on a bone assemblage in a Madagascar cave called Antrahomana. It's shown at the bottom of Madagascar on this uh, map on the left of my slide here. This study showed that the vertebrate community of the surrounding semi-arid spiny bushlands, um, so this is the community that this um, bone assemblage was uh, was sampling uh, was much more diverse only a few millennia ago than it was today. So in this kind of environment on Madagascar, we now know on the basis of this study that key gills are now missing thanks to anthropogenic driven extinctions or range, contra range contractions. And we can only tell that from studying the contents of this cave on the south of the island here. My next example of how the fossil record can help us understand modern conservation questions focuses on species dynamics. So the fossil record is key to understanding the dynamics of species in terms of, for example, their population and their range, that is their geographical distribution. 
In modern ecosystems, unless you're continually monitoring an ecosystem, it can be difficult to spot declines in a species population that falls short of a local extinction. As such, most knowledge of temporal trends of abundance in modern ecosystems is limited to either presence and absence data in a given area or to semi-quantitative estimates. In contrast to that, the fossil record provides a valuable um, kind of retrospective source of data about species and areas of critical con concern and their populations and their ranges in the past. I have chosen two examples to illustrate this. The first was published by Bernie et al. in 2001, that's this paper here, and that uses plant fossil data from a cave excavation on the island of Kauai, Hawaii. This showed that rare plant species that are now restricted to remote montane habitats, so that's mountainous habitats on the island, such as that shown on this image here, were once widespread in coastal land life lowlands, sorry, before human colonization. So this is an example where human colonization has resulted in both a shift of, in the range and in the abundance of a particular species on Hawaii. Paleoecological data has also been used to detect shifts in the geographic distribution of species in response to recent climate change. My example to illustrate this is by Emsley et al. It was published in 1998. And this, um, this study used bones from breeding sites on Anvers Island in the Antarctic Peninsula. And so the, the study showed that these sites were occupied exclusively by a species of penguin, the Adelie penguin, shown on the right-hand side here, throughout the Little Ice Age from 1400 to 1850. Nowadays, the Gen 2 and Chinstrap penguins that um, breed exclusively at these sites only expanded their ranges into this region within the past 50 years. And this was presumably in response to climate warming. So a really good example of how fossil data, or in fact, in this case, not even fossil data, just um, leftover bones that haven't been fossilized from some penguins have highlighted a shift in um, the species makeup of an area due to climate change. And I wanted to finish um, today's or this video by highlighting um, something about human perceptions. So we are all human. I don't think that's much of a surprise to you. I hope it isn't. And I find how that colors our science really, really interesting. Hence, of the many things I could have chosen to finish this video, I chose this one. Um, this kind of reflects the fact that we are all trapped in the present day. The expected norms we have for biodiversity and for ecosystem services are set by what we experience. With successive generations, we would then um, expect our expectations of those services and of biodiversity to be altered and often diminished. As such, we know it requires effort um, to counteract this kind of idea of shifting baselines, of shifting expectations of um, in conservation biology. Historical information is key to informing kind of this norm, to, to let us know when our expectations are creeping. To illustrate that, Paleobiological studies can show that ecological conditions have in fact changed over generations at the most basic level. That's one thing they can show. They can help us um, establish the timing of that change and thereby disentangle the possible anthropogenic and natural drivers of that change in addition to identifying it. In the best cases, they may help us establish what is natural, or at least what biological conditions have prevailed at some specific time interval in cultural history. So that kind of last point is couched in the caveat that the idea of what is natural is a moving target. There's, you know, everything is changing. So what we consider natural is actually a really difficult and important question. My example to illustrate um, this kind of um, idea of shifting baselines is taken from a paper by Zamora Arroyo and Flesser that was published in 2009. And this uses paleontological evidence to show a progressive diversion of the Colorado River water in the 20th century that had significant impact on the productivity of the water in the northern Gulf of California, this area that's shown on this satellite image here. 
They showed that this um, diversion of the Colorado River led to the functional extinction of key bivalve species. They also show that it suppressed growth rates of the iconic fish, the Tatoaba, that's shown on the right hand side here. This um, species is now critically enda endangered due to overfishing. And they illustrated a whole range of other faunal effects of this river diversion. So this study provided the first science-based estimates of the water flow across the US-Mexico border that will be needed to restore some modicum of marine ecosystem services in this area. So they have essentially shown the shifting baselines in this particular area, the Gulf of California, which is really, really important if you want to try and kind of counteract the human influences that are happening at the moment. So I hope that was a series of interesting examples and I will see you back here for video number three, which is more examples, but examples focusing on environmental stresses. So I hope it will be interesting. I'll see you there in a second.